Uh, good morning. It is always um, a tremendous privilege to have the opportunity to speak to senior leaders in our education system. So uh, I'm really grateful that the Schools Network have invited me to speak to you this morning. Very hard to follow Tim. I find him quite emotional. I don't know if you're feeling emotional, but I was feeling emotional watching him. Uh, I work a lot with him. And uh, I think one of the great things about our Olympic and Paralympic athletes is not the medals they win, but the journeys they take. And I think when you unwrap those journeys, they are journeys which can really give very strong and meaningful messages to our young people. And I think it's one of the most powerful things we have, actually, in our sporting system, is both our athletes and our young people themselves that travel this, this journey, this personal life-changing journey, where sport is the driver for that change. Uh, this morning, I've been asked to talk to you about every child having talent, uh, and I want to really look at that in, in two ways. The first is to, to look very much at the, the whole business of physical development and physical talent and sporting talent. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on participation today, but I'm sure you know and I'm sure you would agree that a child that has a strong sense of well-being uh, uh, and feels really well and confident about themselves, a little bit like Tim's round-shouldered eight-year-old to the more confident secondary pupil, is a better learner. So getting young people active, developing healthy lifestyles, generating a sense of well-being in our youngsters is really important. Uh, and I think we can sometimes forget that, uh, and that it isn't always the formal physical education and sports structure that provides that. Sometimes it's those early morning sessions, the way we organise lunchtime, even travel to school. Being physically active and having a sense of well-being is definitely an underpinning to self-esteem and learning. But I am going to talk a little bit about performing and competing. But the message I'd want to give here is that for me, um, talent is something that is about personal best. It's about individuals striving to be the very best that they can be. Uh, and one of the messages we often give our young ambassadors yesterday is that each of them is unique. Each of them is a very special individual. Uh, and you know that in your schools. Um, and what we would want for them through physical education and sport is that they find something that they enjoy, that they strive to improve, and that actually they achieve their personal best. And again, if I can draw an analogy for you, I think sport provides an environment where striving for personal best can be something that you can not only do intrinsically, you can draw out of a child extrinsically. You know, one of the challenges I know in many of our schools is aspiration. So we can inspire children, but can we get them to aspire to reach higher, to go beyond what perhaps has happened to their parents, perhaps the vision given to them by their peers? What is it that drives that aspirational sense of, I can go beyond this. What drove Tim to believe he could? And often it is that teacher. It's that one moment where someone says, I believe you can. And I believe sport provides a really important context where we can strive for personal best, where we can learn what it takes to be our best. And if we can draw that out and use it, I do believe we can affect learning in other areas of the curriculum. So I'm going to talk quite a bit about um, improvement and performance and personal best. And the third area that any of you who've worked with the Youth Sport Trust will know has probably been defined by many of our schools, especially sports colleges, as probably one of the biggest drivers of change in their school is young people as leaders. And I know that we don't just have sport leaders, you now have maths leaders and English leaders, uh, leaders in your schools. I think one of the most powerful things we've learnt over the time is that there are some young people that quite naturally step forward as leaders. Uh, the milk monitor kids, as I would call them. They're quite natural leaders within our schools. What's been really exciting has been how much you can transform people's learning who are perhaps not the natural leaders. Indeed, even those with real behavioural challenges. I have seen young people who others would have deemed as being almost unteachable um, being given leadership opportunities in sport, where actually the responsibility of leading others, the responsibility of being in charge, has transformed their language first and their behaviour second. 
So I'm very strongly of the belief that leadership, again, practiced through sport, using sport as a context, can be mighty powerful in affecting how our young people um, conduct themselves, responsible citizenship, um, behave with others, peer leadership, all really important things, as you well know. So I'm very conscious that um, I want to talk about all young people today. So I'm not just talking to secondary colleagues who are here. I'm also talking to my primary colleagues who are here. And I'm also talking to those working in schools with special needs. I believe this personal best, access to sporting opportunity, developing talent through sport and in sport should be available to every child. And we still have a lot of work to do in terms of our inclusion and making sure that every child is not just included, but is included in this pursuit of excellence. Inclusion is, in a sense, easy to uh, participation. Inclusion in terms of striving for personal best is a much bigger challenge. The other thing I want to talk about is really um, to celebrate the amazing work that has been done over the last 10 years by the movement of sports colleges. And whilst I know many structures are changing and policies are changing, I don't think causes necessarily change. I think it's the mission, the cause, that held that movement together. It wasn't being called something, it wasn't getting additional money, although that was very nice. It was the cause. It was an awakening, really, amongst a group of very good head teachers and their extremely talented staff that actually they could use sport to help deliver their whole school improvement, that they could use sport to tempt young people into learning in areas that perhaps they weren't wanting to be engaged with. It was an opportunity to develop really a wide range of life skills and it was a real opportunity to celebrate achievement across schools. When we were first asked in 1997 to look after the first 11 sports colleges, um, we made a very clear decision inside the Youth Sport Trust because everybody thought what sports colleges would mean was that they would have the best football teams. It was kind of a sort of inevitable um, equation that people thought yet yeah, sport colleges must be better at sport. Well, many of them did become better at physical education and sport, and many of them have got extremely good teams. But our commitment was not just to do that. Our commitment was to ask questions of the profession about how do you use sport to drive whole school improvement? We think it makes a difference. Can you show us? And I can only speak incredibly highly of colleagues within the school sector, who answered those questions in so many varied and brilliant ways. Ways that helped us look at how we could improve literacy, numeracy, science teaching, behaviour, ethos of a school, attendance, discipline, using sport as a tool for those things. It doesn't do it just because you play. You have to have really creative teachers, you have to have innovative thinking, and you have to have strong leadership. And weren't those the three themes that we just heard said from Ofsted were the key drivers? And, and what we saw was the emergence of this really innovative, creative, dynamic leadership within the sector. You know it sits within every school. Unlocking that, enabling that, um, has been a tremendous thrill for us and watching that happen. So as you know, we, we were able, through the work that we did, to demonstrate very clearly that whole school improvement can be driven when we utilise sport effectively. And I think that's something we must never forget. I, I taught in Mossside, Manchester, when I started my career. And the PE department was past the toilets, you know, down the corridor, past the toilets. And in a way, that's where we stayed. And that with no disrespect to me in the PE department, but that's where we stayed. We never really made the journey up the corridor and nobody ever really understood. But we had a very interesting relationship with children. We had a very different kind of pedagogy. <laughs> we had a different ethos and way of working sometimes. And one of the great joys of the Specialist Sports College movement is I've watched that travel up the corridor and really affect whole school change. 
So the last few minutes, I, I want to kind of just touch on a few things that I think are really fundamental to making sure that every child who has talent can develop and explore that talent. Um, we use this very simple pie graph model. Creating a world-class physical education and sports system. And you may say, well, how far are we up the uh, international comparator list? Well, if I tell you that in terms of the developed world, Australia, New Zealand, uh, many countries in Europe are now taking the practice that was developed by schools, by practitioners, um, supported by the trust, into their systems. And um, Paul talked about uh, bringing alive Seb's message in Singapore. We're working in 20 developing countries around the world where the work that's been pioneered here in working with primary and secondary youngsters is now transforming the lives of over 12 million children in 20 developing countries. So do we have a world-leading system? Maybe not a system, but we have a world-leading mission. And we're very clear now here what we're trying to do. We're not only trying to ensure we have healthy young people who have a strong sense of well-being and that those with sporting talent can explore it like Tim, but also that we can help and support the very, very important work you do every day, reaching out to every child to try to help them be the very best that they can be. So I'm going to just pick out a few of these very quickly um, to pull out some examples. <coughs> Let me take you first to physical education. Physical education is really, really important. And I have often been deeply disappointed with my own profession. I am a physical education teacher. You know, I guess when I went to be a physical education teacher, I really wanted to be a coach, a sports coach. And it's only now, as I look back with all that wisdom of hindsight, that I realise that physical education is such a powerful tool. And it's not about a series of sports opportunities. It's about the way you use it to help young people learn and develop. And in particular, the one area I want to just spend a second or two on is at the primary end. We've taken two years to look at world's best practice in physical education in our primary sector. And we've come up with a programme which called Start to Move, which is being supported by a very good partner called Bupa. I'm not doing that to promote it. I'm doing it to make a very important point. You, whether you're in primary or secondary schools, absolutely know and value literacy and numeracy as a bedrock of all the learning that you can then do. Well, I would suggest to you there's a third area, and it's called physical literacy. And I believe that is a bedrock of a healthy society and of young people who are ready and prepared, have their shoulders back, taking Tim's analogy, and are ready to learn. And we have, I believe, every child has the same right to a high-quality physical literacy development in primary schools as they do to literacy and numeracy. And if we don't get that right, if we do not get that right, and it is a massive challenge... We do not have specialists, as you know, in primary schools. The amount of time devoted to physical education teacher training is very slender. The problem is that we are therefore not teaching this subject with the quality that we need to. And I am determined that we must do that. And those of you in secondary schools have been given by the Department for Education a teacher release post, a follow-up to the school sport partnerships. Please use that, and please use that to reach out to help create this physical literacy base that we need. Because those youngsters will not just come to you better physically equipped, they'll come to you as better learners. The next thing I want to just talk about for a moment is competition and talent. You will have heard of the school games. Uh, the school games looks, at first glance, like another jolly good initiative. But it's much more than that. And the Youth Sport Trust would not be centrally involved in its design and delivery if we thought it was a one-off initiative. It's a strategy. And it is a strategy to try to get the personal best message into every single primary, secondary and special school. So it is about competition. But it's not just about the first 11. 
It's about helping children to strive to achieve their personal best. It's about using people like Tim coming into schools. Well, they're not just speaking at uh, uh, assemblies, but really working alongside your youngsters to try to draw out some of these really important values that we heard Tim talk about and messages. So for me, school games is way more than an initiative. It's an ongoing strategy. It will have longevity. I can promise you that for as much as I can promise you anything. Nothing stays forever, I now know. Um, But it will stay for at least the next four years. And it gives us a chance not to invest in a programme or an initiative, but it gives us a chance to really draw out this personal best concept. So don't just sign up to the school games because it's a chance for more competition. Sign up to the school games because you see it as a maypole, an opportunity to tie so many of the things you want to do developmentally around a particular strand and to use sport very powerfully to change some of the visions of some of your young people that perhaps it can reach where other things just simply can't. I've talked a little bit about leadership and volunteering, but I want to just have a look at some of the opportunities within the school games for what we can do here to actually help think through how we can drive some of the other agendas that you have. So let's take the bottom one on that list for a start. Think about it. Young people are sports journalists, sports statisticians, hard word to say, sport team managers, coaches, leaders. Forget the word sport a minute, just think about those other words. Think of the possibility of what can happen if we use the school games to drive some of that added value learning. I can't do that for you, and I wouldn't be presumptuous enough to try. But you can. You can think about your wider school development plan and how you use this to drive at some of the issues you may have, whatever they are. But this is a really good way of engaging young people in a much wider framework than simply sports for itself. Think about the next one up, developing young people as committed volunteers. One of the great challenges we have in our society now is that the volunteer workforce is very, very old. I addressed um, a conference UK athletics officials the other day and I said I was most grateful because until I'd arrived I thought I was old. Um, They were ancient, okay. Uh, Real challenge for us, you know, 2012 is fantastic and people are hanging on to get to 2012. But after 2012, (laughs) what will happen is an awful lot of those people will leave the system. An awful lot of those people. What happened in Australia? Massive volunteering up to 2012. An amazing drop-off to below Sydney levels after Sydney. So it's really important we inspire young people to want to play their part in very important volunteering, not just in sport, but in their communities, reaching out. Some of the great work many of you have done using your secondary pupils, going into primary schools, uh, running lunchtime sessions, really inspiring work. And finally, I just want to go back to my raising achievement. I've said a few times that I think just encouraging participation and well-being will help improve. And you know that, because many of you have healthy school uh, approaches. And I know we've done a lot around diet and food. I sometimes think we haven't got that balance around activity quite right. How can we improve subject attainment? Well, my colleague Annette Montague, who's my education director, has led some amazing work, uh, again, thanks to practitioners, really looking at not um, just very simple solutions, uh, but finding quite intriguing and fascinating ways of using sport to underpin um, both literacy, numeracy and science. And, and I, you know, I remember going into a basketball session in one of our sports colleges where uh, there was a five-on-five game going on, uh, five youngsters uh, recording using um, IT, uh, five writing a little match report, and after 15 minutes they all swapped around. They used the match reports in English, they used the statistical analysis in maths and IT. How creative was that? 
So don't see the PE department as somehow somewhere where the physical thing happens and the serious business happens up the corridor. It doesn't. You can use that to really drive some of the agendas you want to, and particularly to reach some of those youngsters for whom learning some of those areas of work would not be their first choice. I was one of those. I was one of those. We've certainly also shown that we can improve behaviour and attendance. Uh, silly strategies, I guess, but putting on sport on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock when attendance was a challenge for some schools. Uh, really looking at using, you know, those kids with some of the strongest behavioural challenges and turning them into leaders. My first example of that, Moss Side Manchester, I better not use the name, a young lady who was an immense challenge, who... I had no idea about young people as leaders in those days, but the only way I could work with her was to work alongside her. She was never going to be told. That girl went from being a youngster on what today would be an offender's register of some kind to actually being a matron in a hospital. She didn't become a great sports person, but through that opportunity, she learnt to feel good about who she was, to stand a little taller, and like Tim to realise she could. And once she realised she could, she engaged in learning. And once she engaged in learning, she found her own passion, which was to become a nurse and go on to be a matron. And finally, um, the values. I know Tim reeled them off, and um, I'm going to bore you and reel them off again, but they are really key values, and I bet they are in every one of your school plans. Excellence, respect, friendship, courage, determination, equality inspiration. Just think if that were our school plan. Just think if instead of the way we write our school plan, we write it against those behaviours, against those ambitious, aspirational behaviours. And we think about how we're going to drive those behaviours across our school, as well as how we're going to drive attainment. So I will finish by saying this to you all, if I may. This has been the hardest year of my life uh, at the Youth Sport Trust. Not a year I would care to repeat, if I'm honest. But one of the things that has inspired me, motivated me, is you. Uh, Your determination through whatever change comes your way, whatever policies come and go, your determination to do the best you can for your children. I'm proud to work alongside you and I hope that we can continue to work in partnership and really help every child develop their talent, walk tall and be the very best that they can be. Thank you very much.